Okay, we are recording and it looks like we are live on Facebook as well. Welcome everyone. Yeah. February, first Friday of Facebook Live on the Ask a Bookkeeper Show. Our mission on the Ask a Bookkeeper Show is to take the big intimidating ideas that often scare small business owners away from following their dreams and we simplify them to turn them into just another fun part of the adventure of running a small business. So think of us like Sesame Street for small business owners. Keep in mind that our show is largely crowdfunded, which is why we're not advertising or thanking any sponsors today. So if this information is helpful to you and you want to see this show succeed and grow, please visit askabookkeeper.com and click the big button to donate. From there, you can also access our YouTube channel and our Facebook group where you can catch past episodes and participate in the ongoing discussions to help your business succeed. So pretty please subscribe to us on YouTube to get our numbers up and be sure to tell your friends how awesome this is. I am your co-host Ingrid Edstrom of Polymath LLC where my fantastic business partner Vanessa and I do fun um, business strategy services for tours and activities companies. And my co-host today is our favorite procrastinator Gator. Hey! <laughs> Gator really wanted to talk with our special guest today who also happens to be one of my favorite thought leaders in the accounting world. Mr. Ed Kless, welcome Ed and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yay. Well, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Kless. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Thanks. Pleasure to meet you too, Greater. Yeah. So Ed, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do with Sage before we dive into our topic today? Sure. I, I'm actually an employee of Sage and have been for 15 years, which is as incredible to me as it is to anyone else that I've been around that long. Seems uh, like can't possibly be true, but it is. Uh, for, the, for most of the first 10 years, I worked mostly with our mid-market partner organizations who are either at the time reselling. Now we don't resell software. We just sell because it's all in the cloud. So we sell software and then also help them with uh, implementations. But for the last five years or so, I've been spending more of my time with our Sage Accountants Network and the folks who do accounting and bookkeeping, working with them, and they are more influencers on our customers, although sometimes with through uh, client advisory services and things like that, they do use our software in order to, to help these small businesses do the book. So my, my, my title is officially Senior Director of Partner Development and Strategy, which is mm -hmm. completely meaningless. Wow, uh, that's, that's a mouthful, yeah. and that's, that's yeah. saying something coming from me. It, it does. It's, it, and it's way longer than my name on the business card. So it's weird. It's like Ed class and then senior. But so it's kind of weird. But the deal, the deal is, is I like to build myself as a meta consultant. In other words, I spend most of my time consulting about consulting to people who are consultants, which is weird. Wow. Fun. <laughs> I think it's fantastic because I've gotten to go to several of your breakout sessions at conferences and things like that and love the podcast that you do with Ron Baker. If anybody yeah. wants to look that podcast up, it's, it's Heart of the Enterprise. Soul of the Enterprise. Soul, soul of the, the Enterprise. Uh, just Soul of Enterprise. No, the Enterprise. Just soul, the Soul of Enterprise. It's yep. fantastic. And that's actually part of what inspired our topic today was um, the most recent episode of your podcast that I listened listen to was on occupational licensure. And you were talking primarily, you know, as far as the accounting industry goes, um, but then also branched into other industries. And we really wanted to talk with you about that in general, and also in, you know, view of the accounting industry and with tours and activities companies, because that was one of the industries that you mentioned in your podcast that day was that tour guides in many states have to be licensed. And we yes. wanted to touch on the pros and cons of that. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about what occupational licensure means, Ed? Well, sure, and, and I wanna and also draw a distinction between occupational licensure and certification, which I think is, is they're oftentimes confused with each other. Um, occupational licensure simply means that one has to have some kind of a certificate or a piece of paper from a governmental agency. Sometimes it's a city, sometimes it's a state. It can even be uh, the federal government to a certain extent in the US, but most of them occur at the state level, that in order to practice your chosen profession, you must have have a license to do so from the state. 
And usually this also then means a, a series of uh, requirements that you have to go through, whether it's a number of hours that you have to study or a test that you've got to pass. Uh, or uh, sometimes other things that are involved in getting that license. Um, as opposed to a certification, a certification is where a, a, a group, an outside organization, sometimes a, either a for-profit or a not-for-profit organization, certifies an individual that you have obtained a certain amount of knowledge in a particular field, right? And there's no state requirements. Now, sometimes these then go hand in glove, meaning for accountants, as an example, there is usually a certification process, right? Certified public accountant, but that certified public accounting also doubles as, as your license from the state in order to be able to practice, right? So that's why they're oftentimes confused. I am strongly, strongly love the idea of certification. I think certification is an important thing and can be, can be used to help and to the benefit of, of consumers who are looking to make sure that they get a professional who's well versed in what they're where they're talking about. But I do not like the idea of of state the state having to sanction it uh, for lots of different reasons. So I'm opposed to occupational licensure, but I favor the idea of certifications. Fantastic. So in the case of occupational licensures, um, one of the, the examples that I love as to why this maybe isn't a very good idea is from Daniel, Daniel Mitra Suskin's book, The Future of the Professions. And the yeah. way that he described it in there is that it's the rabbits guarding the lettuce, <laughs> making it so that the profession <laughs> is um, policing themselves, which makes it so the policing doesn't mean a whole lot. Can you right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's part of it, and it's also because in most cases, the what, what what the professions are doing when they have state licensure is that they're preventing new people from coming in, right? Um, the and 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 of course, what that does, of course, is it creates a restriction in the supply, which means we can increase prices. So the bottom line is, is what this is about. It's about protectionism in some way, and making sure that those who are already certified, already, I should say, already licensed, see, I get them confused too, already licensed, um, and th who are members of the club can make sure that they can impose higher prices on those because they can say, hey, there's only a certain number of us who do this, right? And I think that that, that inherently is a problem, mostly because licensure has just gotten berserk. I mean, just the things that you have to be licensed for in so many states are crazy. Um, we can, if you have a place to put links or stuff, but I'll, I'll suggest I'll, you can either go to the, the Soul of Enterprise episode on this or write to the, the, the um, there's a, a, a great work that was done by uh, the, I'm trying to remember the name of the organization, American Enter Enterprise Institute about license to work. All right. And all of the things that you have to go through in different states, for example, in my great state of Texas here, you have to be licensed to shampoo someone's hair other than your own. What? Now that just <laughs> doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, you know, it's something that you do uh, every day, uh, you, but you can't do it to someone else without a sign. By the way, and you re it requires more time and a higher fee than it does to become an emergency medical technician. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> now is that, is that mostly for like hairstylists? Like does it go in with becoming a hairstylist? Or is that now, just for shampooing? It's, 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 th there's also licenses for barbers and, and co cosmetologists and all those other things too. But yep, there's a separate license for hairstylists. In your state, are you Louisiana, right, Gator? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Do you know that you have to have a license to be a florist in Louisiana? Because, you know, the dangers, the dangers that against the, we need to protect the public from poorly arranged floral arrangements. I, mean, I, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, certainly we don't, we don't want people going out and just picking flowers here and there, but most florists are getting them from growers. So that, I don't understand why that would be the case. Well, and, and that's just it. And the, we, we do know why it is the case, and that is to keep people who want to do floral arranging as a side business or something out uh, and away from the competitive florists that are trying to have businesses themselves. And that's the uh, reason for it. Wow. Well, and yep. it's funny because both of these states you're talking about shampooing in, in Texas and floral arranging in Louisiana, both these states are traditionally about small government and less bureaucracy. You know, why, why, how would that ever get voted in? I just, 
Yeah. It, it, yeah. And that's the thing is that it, it, if you look at it for, in terms of what, what does it actually do? There is, there is zero evidence that any licensure actually does what it's intended to do, which is protect the public from, from bad actors. Right. right. Very, very little evidence that that actually happens. There's a whole ton of evidence that what it does is in fact, based on, um, the polit political organization is a far better predictor of licensure. In other words, if you have, if you're politically organized as a group and can lobby your legislature to get this done, that is a much better predictor than danger, the, the, than the danger that a profession poses to the public. And you know how we know this is because we measure liability insurance, right? You know what the liability insurance is for a florist? Add or near zero. <laughs> I, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> right. But in other, in, other, in other cases, so the more politically powerful your organization is, the more likely you are to, be, to, to incorporate licensure. So it's, it's, it's the very fact is, is it's just about political organization more than anything. Well, but, but surely you're not <laughs> recommending that, that florists don't get licensed if it's a requirement, right? You're going you're gonna to expect them to do that. Well, I would, I would say this. I think we should do away with licensure for florists and other things. I personally think we should be able to do away with licensure all the way on up to, to doctors, right? I think, I, again, uh, I think certification is important, but even a doctor, it doesn't really matter. Why should the state have that license, right? And let me give you an example. And this is an actual conversation that happened in the Supreme Court right, between two of the justices, because this there was a case that came up about licensure. And uh, I think it was uh, Justice Alito and um, uh, Justice Breyer talking to one another. And they said, well, surely we wouldn't want to have it so that, we, that brain surgeons wouldn't be licensed, right? And the other one said, well, no, well, of course not, but we're talking about different things. Well, here's the reality. And this is justices of the Supreme Court. Brain surgeons are not licensed, right? <laughs> Meaning... Meaning you have to have a license to be a doctor, but not conduct brain surgery. So someone who has, who, who is a podiatrist could in theory perform brain surgery legally. There's no wow. legal on it. So there's no such now brain surgeons are certified, right? So there's a board that certifies brain surgeons. Now, of course you say, you say is, well, why do we never hear about podiatrists doing brain surgery then, right? If they, why do we never hear about stuff like that? And the reason is, is because there's so many controls that are not, that don't have to do with the state. So where is said podiatrist gonna get admitting privileges to a hospital? What insurance company is going to cover a podiatrist who does brain surgery, right? So the answer is that it's, they're not. Right. So there's all of these other controls that have absolutely nothing to do with state licensure that ensure that bad things, really bad things, certainly don't happen to the public, not the least of which is reputation. Right. And I'm sure in your business, Gator, for example, like, you know, tourism, you know, right. you say, yes, we want to have tour guides to be licensed. But what's more important to you, uh, whether you have a license or whether or not your Yelp page has lots of five star reviews? Hmm. Yeah, well, we, we definitely have licensing for tour guide operators. And for the most part, I'm grateful about that because it, it, it keeps yahoos out of the swamp. You know, people are going to tear apart the environment and, uh, and start taking stuff out of it. It's, there's a certain bit of uh, experience and knowledge, but it sounds like you're talking about certification usually is a way to go for that. Yeah, certification yeah. and reputation, right? Certification and, and reputation are, are crucially important. I mean, and with the, the, one of the main lessons that we've learned from something like Uber um, and, and Lyft is the fact that reputation it, in, in most cases, and I would say in all cases, trumps regulation. It's a much more powerful thing to have a five-star review on Yelp than it is to say, well, this guy, cert, certain person has a certification. Quite frankly, as someone who was a coming to, to Louisiana to participate in a tour in Louisiana, I wouldn't know that you have to have a license to do that, right? right. But I, so I, I wouldn't look for the license. What I would look for is, hey, what are, what are, you, what are your reviews on Yelp? That I would look at. Yeah. Well, well, one of the things I've found in my business is that there are folk out there who do tours and uh, that they're, they're not licensed. And they tend to charge a little less. Like you could just get out in a boat and it costs about half as much as what I'm charging. But I got to do that because I got business overhead, of course, the licensing fees, all that. And a lot, a lot of customers, 
Well, they're first going to look at the price and just go with the lowest one because they're thinking all to a company is the same, right? So what, what do you say about that? Folk who are licensed have to compete with, with folk who aren't. Well, and, and that's where I, uh, that you're making an argument for me, which was to remove the licensure completely. Sure. Right. Get get rid of that so that you don't have to pay those licensing fees and it can reduce your, your overhead. Um, and here's the thing. What you can what you're going to compete on is not price, but you're going to com compete on being a better tour guide. And, and and that that will become evident. Right. And look, th are there people who buy solely on price? Yeah. Can we ever change them? No. But do you do you really like in your Gator when, when you have people who is who are just looking for the cheapest price coming to your business? Right, because usually they're also the the the, the not, not the hardest people to please. Yeah, they're the ones that are complaining that I'm charging them extra for a sandwich. Yeah, or charging yeah. extra for a sandwich, or they're complaining about the humidity. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get that all the time. We just laugh at them. So yeah. Ed, yeah, I think one of the the main focuses as far as licensure goes, and this goes for tour guides, contractors. Any business that's required to hold a certain amount of insurance in case something gets damaged or somebody gets hurt, mm -hmm. that that's a big part of where the licensure comes in. So if an unlicensed Bayou tour guide goes out and somebody falls off their boat and gets eaten by a gator, who are they going to sue? Lucky gator. <laughs> Well, they're going to still sue that that person that brought them out as an individual who brought them out on the boat. And again, this is where it does get confusing, right? This notion of of certification and and insurance. Now, I'm all in favor of people having insurance for certain things, and that's another way that you could that one could differentiate themselves in the business by saying I'm a I'm I'm an insured tour guide, right? Or we have full insurance, and that's something that you should check and probably put on your website that hey. It, you know, yeah, there's there's tour guides out there, but you should check to see if they're insured because there's a very real possibility or a danger of someone being hurt. But that's the, that's the differentiation. And it really, it, it really comes down to me. It's about why should the state be involved in saying who can and who cannot do something for to make a living? Uh, and this goes back as far back as the Magna Carta. There's a line in the Magna Carta that talks about every individual, it does say man, by the way, uh, that every man should, should, should be able to work at his own chosen profession, right? And, you know, so why should we put these barriers in there when, especially when we do have things like reputation and insurance and all of those things that do the exact same thing without state interference? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not surprised that those, those uh, men who drafted up the Magna Carta didn't include gators in there. They don't have no. gators in England. No. Yeah, exactly. Not in England. Yeah. So but I'm that, still disappointed about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that would remove the situation where the rabbits are guarding the lettuce. Yeah. But, well, I like it. I like it when the rabbits are guarding the lettuce. You know, it puts them all in one place and they tend to be slow, easy to catch. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> <laughs> nice gator. Yeah. So Slow rabbits. I want to use another example in Louisiana, something more, um, more historical, more environmental. When we were in New Orleans, we went on a cemetery tour and we found out that not only do all of the guides have to be licensed um, and registered and such that the reason why is because they can't get into the cemeteries without a license because there was really bad vandalism going on in Louisiana's historic cemeteries. And tour guides who just wanted to make a buck and take people to see the cemetery were bringing people in there and damaging grave sites, many of which were historic, cannot be replaced, and it was causing damage. And in other places, particularly really environmentally sensitive places, Things like over-tourism causes a big problem. So um, by offering licenses for tour guides, yeah, it does limit the number of tour guides that can operate within a particular area, which in turn limits the number of tourists to a certain extent. Trying to make it so that certain sites are only accessible when you're with an experienced guide to ensure that people aren't just tromping around and damaging places that once they're damaged will never recover. What do you think about that, Ed? 
I think that still the, the same thing could still be accomplished without a state licensure, right? I mean, you, you, cert you certainly still can reduce the, t the total number of people who are taking any particular tour or going any particular place. Uh, with regard to these, these cemeteries and grave sites, for example, I assume that, they, that, that they can't, you can't just walk in there and there's some kind of a lock on the door, right? So, now there is. There didn't used to be. Right. right. And so so, so, so who, who owns the lock? The, so the question is, who owns the lock? Right? Is that a governmental agency or is that a private company? And if it's a private company, if it's a private cemetery or owned by who, you know, who, whomever, the then church. That, yeah, the, the church, then the church, then the church should say, Hey, listen, we reserve the right to put a restriction on who can and who cannot come into our cemetery. But that does not, it does not pertain to us whether or not they have a state mm -hmm. license. I think this, again, it's just my, my concern is the state license part of it. Not necessarily that we don't have, um, restrictions, especially with regard to private property. I'm, I, I can decide who can and cannot come onto my, my private property, no matter what. That, so that's for sure. That's certain. Well, now that, that also gets back to what you were talking about with certification as opposed to licensing. So right. like the church with the cemetery, for instance, they could say only certified tour guides, and maybe that certification happens through the church or maybe an organization of historic sites or something like that. And, and, but, then, but then you get the issue where if it's going on public land, like, like the bayou, then that certification is done through a private entity that also has to work with the state. What do you say about that? Yes, and, and, and we do have uh, uh, precedence for that because one of, one of the, the other key differences between licensure and certification is that with licensure, there's only one person or only one group that can do it, and that is the state. Whereas certification, you can have actually competing certification organizations. So if one organization that, uh, that has certification that makes their, their requirements far too stringent, let's say, right? It increases the price of the education that you have to do or whatever it is that to, to become cert certified. Well, another certification body could, be, could create itself right? That would be then allowed to, to, to um, create that's a different type of similar to certification. And then you would have a choice as a tour guide as to which certification you wanted to get, depending, depending upon which one was the, the, the better choice. With a license, you don't have that. It has to be at the state level, right? And that's the problem is that then once you get to the state level, you get the, you know, you get the rabbits guarding the lettuce, right? That because there's only one place to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, Ed, one of the reasons why we got the Ask a Bookkeeper show together in this community, um, one, supporting small business owners, but also supporting um, bookkeepers who are working to enter the industry. Because, of course, we all have to learn something the first time at some point. And since bookkeepers do not have a required license or even a required certification, um, there's, there's kind of a delicate balance between anybody being able to hang out a shingle and say, hey, I'm a bookkeeper without any background education versus um, having there be some kinds of requirements. And in our community, we, we generally encourage people get certified in the software that you want to support and encourage them to get certified as a bookkeeper in some way. So Vanessa and I are certified through the Institute for Certified Bookkeepers, ICB. Their certification is actually pretty new in the United States. And previous to the ICB putting out a much more up-to-date certification, the other options available were not keeping up with the times. And it's kind of an interesting, an interesting problem that we have, partly because as bookkeepers, we are essentially management accountants. We help business owners with their day-to-day -day transactional recording, understanding the reports, and their business strategy. And a lot of brand new bookkeepers don't know how to get that deep into it. They don't understand a lot of the ins and outs. We all had to learn it at some point somewhere, and we wanted to create a community where people could learn that and ask the beginning questions without feeling stupid and without being told that they're doing a disservice to their clients because we have to get it somewhere. Um, but where's, I guess, where's the line? How do we establish new people wanting to get into the industry if there isn't a set path to follow? Because I know that some of the other certifications that were available before the ICB have become extremely out of date, haven't been updated in 20 plus years and are teaching people how to do management accounting on a six column ledger or 
the founders of those organizations are currently in jail for tax fraud. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and look, this is this is a great example. I mean, you, I think you're you're right in alignment with my thinking here. Is if certification organizations, I mean, remember, separate from licensure, certification organizations become stayed, they will be replaced and should be replaced, right? So I think that's a, that's a good thing. And uh, again, a bit very much in favor of using the certification process through some kind of a private organization. I've done a lot of work with with uh, with ICB and IPBC in Canada as well, um, and. I, and you know it's it's funny because that one of the conversations that we I oftentimes get in at, at your conferences is this notion well should shouldn't we bring this to make it be, you know become licensed and I'm like you don't want to do that right because <clears throat> you know your example of uh, the organization becoming state well that's exactly what what's happened right now in the medical profession right you have so many doctors graduated medical school 20 30 40 years ago right it, there's not much of a string there's not much of a, of a requirement that they have to do from an educational perspective to stay up to snuff on the latest treatments for people it's it's sad but true which is why doctors right now um, I, I think they they are one, ones who are who are learning that reputation is more important than regulation because because the doctors that are staying up to date are the ones that are getting more and more of the patients coming to them because they, mm. they're known through word of mouth hey this is the guy or gal that you got to go to because they know the latest and greatest when it comes to sports medicine let's say right <clears throat> yeah well and that gets then to specialization too the riches are in the niches yeah yeah yeah, Absolutely. especially for a doctor, for doctors, for that's that that's certainly the case. And I think that that's actually a problem in the medical profession that so many people are getting specialized. I think it's roughly about seventy percent of doctors today are specialized. Um, and you think you would think that that's an overall good thing, but the reality is, is most of us don't need the specialists to just make sure that we're okay, right? Yeah, right. right. We just need blood, our blood drawn once a year to make to to all systems go, right? <laughs> Um, and there are unfortunately not enough folks who are doing that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, you know, before we got on the call here, we were talking a little bit and, and I don't know if, uh, we're done talking about licenses and stuff, but you'd also mentioned life after Google. If we oh, got yeah. any time, if we got a bit of time to talk about that, I'm really curious what you're talking about with that. Okay. Well, life, life after Google is a book by um, a guy by the name of George Gilder. George Gilder has been writing books, um, I think since the 80s, in fact, his first one is right here, Wealth, Wealth and Poverty. Um, and he is, um, he's a really interesting guy. I would call him an economist, but he, he wouldn't say that. Uh, it, he, Life After Google is based on the, the foundational premise that Google has a problem, and the problem is, is that they give too much away for free, right? Oh. All right. um, it's worked for them so far. <laughs> uh, well, it's worked for them so far, but the the, the challenge is is that they, what what because of that they have there's a lot of problems inherently with the security of the internet. As you probably are aware, the internet was not designed to be secure; it was designed for sharing. <laughs> Right. right. This is this is why you have to know your mother's maiden name, the street you grew up on, you know, your first dog's name, all of these different things, um, in order to 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 pass muster sometimes with security because security is not built in. And he's suggesting in Life After Google that because of that, there is an inherent flaw with the current infrastructure in the internet today. Um, and now this from a man who in 1994 wrote a book called Life After Television in which he pretty much predicted what we see now, NetSuite, Hulu, right? All of these things that you would, you would, you would want to, and you would, and handheld devices that we, you know, we, remember 1994, a cell phone was actually a phone. Now <laughs> I can't remember the last time I made a call on my cell phone, right? I use it all, I use it every day, <laughs> but not for calls. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, so, th so he, so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, I, I think when it, when it comes to this topic and, um, I, and we don't, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but just, but suffice it to say that the, the, that the price system, right? What you and I pay for things in addition to being an incentive system, right? We, we make money, we have an incentive to create wealth for others so that we can capture some of that wealth in a price that we get. Right. So in addition to being an incentive system, it is also an information system. Right. Uh, the information system and what's conveyed through price is 
the value of something in the open market, right? Now, Google, which doesn't charge for your gmail.com account because it's free, right? But instead what they do is they pop, they, they, they show you ads and they read your email and they do all of these things to your data because you said, okay, you'll, you can do this for me for free, right? The, the, the challenge now becomes they don't have the information through the price system to know whether or not what they offer you in those, for those services is truly valuable to you or not, right? Mm. So, so as, a, as a result, what potentially will, will, will happen is that we are going to begin to gravitate to systems that are more and more secure, right, that we do pay for even if it's smaller amounts. Quick example, because we don't have a tremendous amount of time. I've been using for the last six months a new browser called the Brave browser. It's brave.com. I don't, I don't have any, any money with them. It is a chrom chrom it's a Chromium-based browser, right? So meaning it, 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 it functions essentially like, like Chrome, but since it's based on the same cr initial code base. But it's, it's, it's also built on the, the Ethereum blockchain. So the, the concept is, is that as you begin to visit websites that also are involved in, in the, this network, you'll, small micropayments will transfer from you to the person whose blog that you're reading, right? And vice versa, you can begin to set up your own sites so that when people come to visit you, there will be these micropayments that get made all in the background. Right, and we won't even see this. So, in fact, this is this is what's led me to th to, th to this conversation. Is you know we've heard a lot about blockchain. When are we going to know that blockchain has arrived? And the answer is when we don't talk about blockchain anymore because it's just <laughs> embedded in what we do. Right? Um, it used to be very important that you knew what your TCP/IP address was on your computer. I don't know what mine is. Do you have any clue what yours is? Like, no, uh, no, no. no. right? Because no. it just works. Right. And that's the same thing is going to work be with blockchain. It's just going to be working in the background to in, in, ensure all of these micro payments that are happening. And this is the thing that will eventually, and this is what Gilder's book is about, take out Google, maybe not in five years, maybe not in 10 years. And maybe Google will still be around in a different thing. But just the, the, the Google is shorthand for this notion of we get stuff for free. Right. Yeah. Um, and we, we now know the reality is as, and, and as I think, uh, Tim, Tim Cook from Apple said, when you're not paying for your, pro your product, you are the product. Right. I've heard that before. So, yeah. so that's, that, that, that's the, the gist of it. It's, it's, there's a lot to it, but in uh, that just wanted to give the overview from that perspective. Well, and, and I had even heard once before, again, uh, it, it was on a, you, you've heard of Adam ruins everything. Right. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm not getting paid by him or anything like that either, but he had said something about uh, if, if we were to pay for Google or Facebook that uh, the research shows we'd actually only be paying like 20 or $30 a year for each service. And like, yep. if, if you could pay 20 bucks and not have all them ads everywhere, wouldn't you do that? But they Absolutely. don't even give you, don't even give you the option anymore. Yeah, you wouldn't even give it a second thought to it. And look, again, there's there's a situation where it's back to consumer choice. If we give consumers choice to do those things, and then you can make a decision, do I want the free version or not? I think this is going to happen in accounting software. I think that we're going to have all these systems that that you that are are going to be for all intents and purposes free if you agree to let the publisher, whoever that may be, whether it's Sage or Intuit or whatever, comb through your data. Right. Right. But if you if but if, if but it's you if you don't want people to come through your data, then you're going to pay whatever it is ten dollars a month, fifty dollars a month, whatever that is, so that your data is excluded from that data set. And, and I will say, if Adam Runes Everything or Brave.com or any of these products want to give us money, we will accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Is that how we get sponsors? Huh. Worth a know. shot. You Just know, start talking ask. about them. <laughs> if you don't ask, the answer is no. <laughs> right, exactly. That's right, that's right. So with that, we are a few minutes past the hour, and I want to respect everyone's time. Um, we, wow, I, I love Life After Google and these ideas, and I loved the fantastic webinar that you did with CPA Practice Advisor Magazine on this topic, and it was just it, it blew my mind and I've, I've added that book to my personal reading list to listen to on audible while I'm working out in the morning. And, um, 
look forward to getting more into these ideas and just nerding out on some of this with you. And Ed, we didn't get to talk about pricing at all today. We might have to have you or Ron back to talk about pricing because I think value pricing is a great topic that we've been hearing a lot about in the accounting industry. And I would love to see how we can simplify some of these ideas and give companies like Gators a good place to start thinking about value pricing for their industries. And um, we might have to save that for another time and just keep talking about some of these nerdy ideas. I love how nerdy you yeah. are. <laughs> In my propeller. Right. You know, the, way, the way I say it at conferences, um, I tell people that I've got a bit of a brain crush on you and Ron. <laughs> and that sometimes I wish I were a zombie just so that I could eat your brains. <laughs> <laughs> little, little too intimate, little too intimate. <laughs> I, I think maybe. We'll have a zombie episode of Ask a Bookkeeper sometime. There we get go. all the nerdy brain goodness going on. <laughs> That'd be funny. That would be so, good. Yay. Thank you for bringing your fantastic brain to us today. And we have gotten some um, great comments on the chat um, on both the, the Facebook Live and also in our Zoom, that um, thank you everyone for being here and participating. And sorry we didn't get to read through those, not so much questions as much as um, comments, many of which were, were, wow, that's really cool, thanks. So people liked our topic right. today, that was wonderful. And um, once again, for anybody who found this information valuable, please visit askabookkeeper.com and support our show so that we can find more ways to bring this information to you. Um, like Google, we are currently giving it away because this is one of the ways that we give back to our community, working to make the world a better place, built on a foundation of thriving small businesses. So thanks so much for joining us, Ed. And Everyone else, um, next month, you're going to get um, Liz Scott and Heather Satterley of the, um, the QB Appy Hour show, talking with Vanessa, as I'm going to be out of town. <laughs> so um, actually, I'll be in Australia. So everyone say hi to me from Australia while you guys are talking about all kinds of amazing appy goodness and particularly talking about fraud prevention apps. So be sure to join us for that. And once again, and I'm, I'm not going to be here next month either. Neither is Penny because uh, our voices are going to be in Australia as well. <laughs> Talk, talking to the crocodiles, most likely. Right. Lots of crocodiles. That's right. We'll have to, we'll have to make sure to tweet the heck out of all of that. Yeah. Yay. Well, well, Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such a pleasure. And, and I really, I want to eat your brain now too, but not in a zombie way. <laughs> I'll stay away from you too, Gator. <laughs> Ed, if there's um, one place where people can easily find more about you, a URL or something, where would that be? Um, well, th I'd love for you to listen to the episodes of The Soul of Enterprise, but I'm very easily found. I'm the only Ed Kless in the world. ED dot K L E double S as in Sam. Can't miss me. Fantastic. Yep. Great. Very nice. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great February. Talk to you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Yeah.